Hello everyone and welcome to the Altium On Track podcast. Recently, I had the opportunity to attend and give presentations at PCB West and this year's conference was incredible. It shattered attendance records, featured mind-blowing exhibitors and presentations, and as always, I had no shortage of illuminating conversations with the world's leading minds in PCB design and manufacturing. So we decided to record a few of those conversations in this special series series of episodes of the Altium On Track podcast. Today's episode is with Philip Gulley, co-founder of CoFactor. We chatted about CoFactor's supply chain risk platform, the challenges of procurement and logistics, CoFactor's Altium 365 interaction, weird counterfeit inspection, and much more. As always, be sure to check the links in the description to learn more about Philip and CoFactor and to get deeper insight into the topics we cover in this podcast. Thank you so much for watching and please enjoy this special edition of the Altium On Track podcast from PCB West 2024. Hello, everybody. We are back at PCB West for a mini On Track podcast episode. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today I'm very happy to be talking with Philip Gulley, co founder of CoFactor. Pleasure to co-founder be here. Co-founder of Co-Factor. Co-founder that has of a nice, Co-Factor. Has a nice ring to it. Yeah, we tried to make it really easy to say. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you so much for being here today. Um, I've talked to you guys before, I think, uh, was it last year or maybe the year before, uh, one of the PCB West or PCB East conferences. Mm-hmm. Forgive me because at some point they blend together a little bit. I don't remember any. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys are running a, uh, a very cool uh, third-party logistics platform. Is that the right way to describe it? Uh, that's definitely a part of it. Part uh, of it? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the easiest way to sum it up is as a supply chain risk management platform. Okay. So that's everything from part selection through uh, sort of leveraging the current market and deciding sort of is this a high risk part, uh, getting ahead of that, the procurement process, the tracking of those materials, making sure that your orders are coming in, resolving those issues all the way through sort of kitting and delivery. Uh, and so we touch a lot of parts of the, the sort of stack that goes into making sure that you're responsibly han- handling your supply chain. Yeah, so that's that's interesting you mentioned all those different things, right? There, There's buying, there's just the tracking and accounting of orders. And then there's another part, which I think a lot of people overlook, which is the kidding. Yep. And then I'm sure there's inspection and stuff that goes into that as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think if you look across the supply chain management platforms landscape, uh, you'll see a lot of options where they're, they're really good at one of those things. Yeah. But there's really not a lot of platforms that have a, a process that handles all of it. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what's, what's unique, and we sort of describe it as a virtuous cycle, uh, is that we are physically touching parts for many of our customers. This is especially startups handling critical components that maybe an organization doesn't have the infrastructure, an ESD safe climate controlled area to sort of like store and manage those materials. So for some of our customers, once they have sort of moved into buying, we'll receive those materials, we'll count those materials on ingest, we'll inspect those materials, store them for them. And this gives us a lot of data on the reliability of the vendors, on uh, delivery timelines, right? Like is the lead time what is reported? Uh, And that's really, really valuable across all of our customer base, which is great. So serving a little bit of our customers in this way, everyone benefits from it. And then the realities of what it takes to get from, I have materials to, I need those materials to arrive at a manufacturing partner, have those be ready and and adequate numbers. So attrition models, considering are, is it multiple projects? Are they running on multiple lines? Is that in parallel or in series? What does that mean to the attrition model? How much commonality is happening between these products? It's a ton of just real world application that I think when you look at like supply chain risk management, that's way out of the normal scope. Sure. Uh, But it's super important because if you're not considering those things early on, and you're buying your parts with the belief that you have enough to manufacture your product, you really need to be thinking about that end-to-end story. Yeah, yeah, that's really true. And I think when you look in the design tools, the design tools are really good at giving you that first look at mm-hmm. what's going on in the supply chain, and help they help you get through the design to make sure something's actually sourceable. Right. But kind of at the end of it, you know, whether you're using Altium or another tool, or if like you're using the bomb portal in Altium 365, you totally. export, 
and that's kind of it, right? right? At that point, the design tool is done, yeah. and then you really need to have a process for managing that procurement and logistics all the way through to the end of the product life cycle. Right. Well, and, and this is why we're really proud to have the relationship we do with Altium. Uh, having a robust integration with 365, working with your team directly to make sure that as those parts are selected that you are getting that sort of complete vision, uh, pushing data, thinking about supply chain, some of those risks back into the design environment, <coughs> uh, sort of giving, uh, surfacing some of those concerns if you do have like a global supply manager that's thinking about these things, are the right parts being chosen, referencing an existing parts library, right? There's so many things and so many sort of balls that can be dropped when you think about all the needs of an organization from NPI through production volume. Uh, and you know, we, we really are trying to kind of fill the gaps that might not be what uh, great, great partners or, or organizations have sort of gone and like done such a great job with like Altium, for example. Sure, sure. Now, when I had last talked to your co-founder, yeah. um, he had talked a little bit about test and inspection of yep. parts that come into your facilities. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that you guys do, which I think is just kind of an evergreen topic, yeah. is counterfeit inspection. Totally. Um, what kinds of measures do you guys take to ensure that you're catching counterfeits early? So this is obviously mostly a problem when you're looking at the gray market, the broker market, uh, where you don't necessarily know that this is going to be a super high reliable vendor, right? Like, sure. And so when we receive those materials, there's a number of tests that we do. I mean, it's everything from like simple LCR in inspection, right? Like literally, are we getting the right behavior out of the part? Uh, optical inspection, we do x-ray inspection, microscopic x-ray inspection, uh, and this covers number of potential issues, right? Like, is there damage to the leads? Uh, is the die in there? We've definitely seen empty casings, which is always a bit of a mind blow when you're like, wow, that's that's just a little plastic box. Um, and then and then there's like a great deal of uh, additional tests, right? So like, yes, having a known good, doing that sort of x-ray inspection, going like, does this part seem legit? Make sure that there's no residue that hasn't been desoldered, right? Checking all those boxes can be huge. Uh, we also <laughs> love working with sort of like external uh, testing facilities, <coughs> if we need to decap, if we need to do some sort of deeper functional tests, right? Like, and managing that for our customers is also something we're very proud to offer. So a lot you can get done in-house in our anti-counterfeiting lab. When you need to go that extra step, we're really proud to be able to offer a management and sort of provide an easy experience when you really need to drill down. Sure, sure. So one of the things that uh, I've always wanted to ask people who do counterfeit inspection, sure. what is the weirdest, craziest counterfeit that you've ever encountered? You mentioned the die not being in the package. Yeah. That one's got to be right up there. That's way up there. So the, 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 the crazy thing is that this was a reel of parts. Okay. Some of them were completely legitimate ICs and some of them were empty casings, right? Dubs for fitting, things like that. And they had been mixed in throughout the reel. So you couldn't, like if you had done a random inspection, right? And then like, oh, we'll do 15 <coughs> samples. If you had looked at the first 10 samples, all of this would have very likely passed, but we, we will often do a 100% inspection. So every single part is being cranked through and we're getting that x-ray inspection. And it was randomly, someone had gone through, hand placed, randomly into the tape about a 35% just empty casing. That is crazy. That's wild, right? That is wild. Yeah, yeah. Someone's like, they're earning it. They're earning that money. They are really <laughs> trying hard, yeah. And and what's crazy too is you, you just mentioned, right, the, the, the front of the reel, totally fine. legit. Yeah, to totally legit. Totally fine. So they, they knew that most likely whoever the buyer was, they're only gonna look at the first five or 10 or 15. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that and that like sixty percent of it was completely legit. They were totally wow. Yeah, high quality parts. <laughs> oh wow. So what do you do in that situation? Do you go back to the to the broker or whoever, or, yeah. or is is that an issue where like, if the broker sold the the counterfeit parts knowingly, they've just disappeared. They're gone. So, so I mean, so they continue to exist, and uh, luckily because we aggregate the needs of a lot of our customers, we we have good relationships with everyone that we buy from. And, and okay. that's an advantage for everyone because getting something not as advertised, right? Like that's a huge problem. Right. And 
for the customer to go and have to fight that battle. That's not a great use of their time. And this is the whole story of Cofactor is basically, is this a good use of your time? If the answer is no, we should be doing it for you. That's kind of our whole thing is just like, sure. truly we've gone into the most boring, terrible things and embraced <laughs> them. Uh, but yeah, so like this is a non-returnable part. It came from a sketchy broker. Like we'll go fight that fight, right? Like okay. that's, and, and in fact, we ensure our broker buys so that like the customer is fine. Right? Oh, okay. and, in, and in this case, okay. it was more nuanced because <clears throat> the decision by the customer was that the 60% of the parts that were legit, they did want those parts. Okay. Uh, because they were in sort of like earlier phases, so it was prototype, right? It wasn't sort of full production. So they, they were like, no, 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 we want to buy those. So it wasn't sure. the normal thing. So we refunded them the 30, 35% or so, whatever, whatever the sort of faulty or the non-existent parts were. And then we went back to that broker and then it's our problem. Right, like it okay. shouldn't be the customer's problem. Sure, like we are uh, we are completely transparent about where those parts come from, what the nature of the relationship is. Uh, we are not a broker. We are like so we're, we're, we don't have a horse in the game of trying to like make money or or obfuscate what the relationship is. Uh, but to our customers, it should not be their problem to try to resolve this kind of stuff. And again, that's sort of that's kind of what our whole thing is like. Look, if you get a partial delivery of material we should be the ones going and getting the rest of that material, right? And, like, sure. and that means a lot of things in a lot of different contexts. But yeah, sort of getting ahead of it, making sure that the customer has a successful outcome and like let us deal with the stuff that you shouldn't have to deal with, right? Like that's, that's uh, we, we, try to, we try to make it nice. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, and I will say myself, the, uh, uh, the act of having to go back and do some of that stuff over again, it's like you want to throw your laptop out the window. Oh, it's wild, yeah. yeah. No, no, I mean, even, uh, this is like, we're very proud of this. Uh, so we, we have, when you think about your communication, your experience with your distributors, your general vendors, right? Uh, outside of the big problems, you have a million tiny problems that can sure. happen, right? You can have sure. delays in material, you can have partial delivery of material, right? Like, and this is this stuff that falls into email communications. This is about POs and invoices and, and emails off the cuff, right? We're really, really proud that sort of beyond those really obvious giant issues, uh, look, if, if you have a, uh, a deadline and you have to assemble your product by a deadline and something gets delayed in a substantial way that's gonna have a negative effect, that can easily be lost in emails. Yeah. And so a big part of what we're doing is our entire platform is running on AWS GovCloud. Okay. We're ITAR registered. Okay. We, are, we are very, very responsible in how we are managing our customers' data, but we get copied on email communication. We get that communication. We then obfuscate it, break it up. Then we can use sort of in a, in a completely anonymized way, LLMs and AI to then aggregate that data back and make sure that like everything that you're doing, everything that you're buying, everything that needs to land at the dock on a date is responsibly managed and that if there's an issue, it's surfaced instead of you having to sort of dig through and like figure out what was the email, where did I get it right? Because if you're dealing with thousands of parts, you're dealing with thousands of parts, that's sure. a lot of things that can go wrong. So it's, uh, it's, we, we try to solve all the little problems as well as the big problems. Awesome, awesome. Well, where can everybody go to learn more about Cofactor? Go uh, over to cofactor.com? Cofactor.com is a great place to go. That's our website. Okay. Uh, you know, or just go on LinkedIn. I was going to say, go find Just Philip Bully on, on LinkedIn. LinkedIn for We're sure. around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Matt is usually posting on, on LinkedIn. So, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of LinkedIn. Everything's yeah. LinkedIn these days. Everything is LinkedIn <laughs> these days. Well, Philip, thank you so much for being here with us. This has been a great chat. Thank and you. I've been trying to get you guys over here for a little bit, so I'm glad we could finally link up at PCB West. Thrilled to do it. PCB West. PCB West. PCB West. <laughs> <laughs> to everybody that's been watching, we've been talking with Philip Gulley, co-founder of CoFactor. If you are interested in learning more about CoFactor, head over to CodeFactor.com. Don't stop learning, stay on track, and we'll see you next time. We're signing off from PCB West. Thanks, everybody.